Uh, there is no bigger guest, in my opinion, than this man. This is a man that started it all. Now, you hear the term legend thrown around a lot. In baseball, Babe Ruth is truly a legend. In basketball, Michael Jordan is truly a legend. But in combat sports, I would argue there are very, very few legends. And this man is one of those very few legends. And I say he started it all because he is the creator and founder of a little company you might have heard of called the Ultimate Fighting Championships, UFC. I welcome you, Art Davy. How you doing, Art? Thank you. It's really great to be here with you tonight. And, you know, um, I was lucky 23 years ago, so it's quite an honor to be told that I'm a legend. But, you know, I was in the right place at the right time. Well, talk about that journey, because as I understand it, you were an advertising executive. You were a successful entrepreneur out in Southern California. And no one had even envisioned. I mean, I, I wrote a book with Eric Paulson called Rough and Tumble, and we kind of chronicled combat sports over over the years. And there, there were little things like, you know, you had Milo Savage taking on Gene LaBelle uh, on TV. It was actually an adjunct to a, to a pro wrestling card. Um, you had that, that kind of boxer versus wrestler thing. But no one even envisioned anything anywhere close to the ultimate fighting championships. How did the concept come about? You know, Matthew, you're right about the fact that there had been a couple of hit or miss mixed matches back in the day. Uh, Milo Savage versus Tudo Jean LaBelle is a good example. Uh, Antonio Inoki versus Muhammad Ali in 1976. But as I point out in my book, Is This Legal?, the thing that always killed these mixed match bouts was the discussion or the argument over two things. Number one, the money, and number two, the rules. You know, uh, the rules would be argued about it, but what can I wear and what can I do? And the money was, how much are you getting and how much am I getting? So the vision that I had was to bring back from the glories of ancient Greece the idea of pancreation, the idea of, of uh, a combat sport where there'd be virtually no rules, no rules barred, and you would allow a striker, a kicker, a puncher to compete with a grappler. And I knew that this would be a big hit, because when you think about it, this was one of the great sports questions that guys would sit around and talk about when they were talking about sports. You know, could Muhammad Ali have beaten Bruce Lee. So what I did was to be able to uh, form a plan, and it was built around two ideas. Number one, it was going to be pay-per-view. I heard the pay-per-view was all about boxing and wrestling, but I knew we'd have to be on that platform to be really successful. I didn't see it as a video, you know, at a blockbuster video store. I saw it as a pay-per-view item, and I knew it had to be a tournament. You know, it couldn't be just one or two guys competing you know, uh, uh, with that kind of uh, rationalism and that kind of divisiveness. I wanted to bring everybody to the party, all the way from Aikido, you know, to Kung Fu and even Sumo. I wanted all the martial arts to be invited. By doing that, I was really able to open this up this time. Yeah, and you know, to any of the younger viewers, because I was well into my 20s when UFC got got started, but there might be some younger folks that don't know this, it was a totally different ball game. It was, it was open weight tournament, and it was so exciting, and I, and I remember when I first saw it, I, coming from an amateur wrestling background and just getting into judo in the early 90s when judo was hot, uh, seeing this thing, and I was like, what in the world is this? You know, and I, I first discovered it in 94, 95, and it, it was amazing, and it was so compelling. And if you go back and you watch those early UFCs, you see it's a totally different product than what's being presented today. But you know, Matthew, it really started out as a style versus style issue. And I remember reading that, uh, you know, that 
Ron L. Sullivan, way back in the day, the bare knuckle boxing. Oh yeah, yeah. Like, he had gone into the ring with, uh, you know, with um, uh, some famous wrestlers back in the day, like William Muldoon, who later became the New York State Athletic Commissioner. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You, you know that story, and you know Sullivan, as tough as he was, couldn't stand up to Muldoon. And James J. Corbett, the gentleman Jim said, eight out of ten times in a mixed match bout between a grappler. And a, and a boxer, the grappler's going to win. So, the grappler's going to win, absolutely. Exactly. So I knew that if we could come up with a format, and uh, quite frankly, a single elimination tournament was the way to go. No weight class. Anybody could compete. There was only two basic rules of no biting and eye gouging. And we would then... Re- I, uh, my, my greatest asset was that by being a salesman and an ad man by training, I could think of this in terms of what the fan needed to see. And I knew the fan was going to tell me, hey, you know, we want to see all the martial arts, but hey, how about bringing in some great amateur wrestlers? What about bringing in a sumo guy, one of the giants from Japan? And what about bringing in a pro boxer? So if it could have been done just by a martial arts guy, a black belt in some martial art, it would have been a parochial exercise. It would have been smaller. My greatest advantage was, I kept thinking to myself, hey, I gotta bring in a tough guy. You know, maybe he's been one of the biker guys. You know, and that's where I got Tank Abbott from. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and you know, it's funny. I, I, I've been working for the last 10 years doing uh, wrestling clinics. I've been in the, in the, in the, uh, uh, the coaching clinic game for years, and, and one of the guys that I did clinics with is Dan the B. Severed, who was involved in the early uh, UFC yeah. season. And Dan and I have have hosted a little comedy show, and and one of the names I kind of throw at him is is uh, Tank Abbott. He always calls Tank Abbott every guy's nightmare in the sports bar. Yes, yes. And yeah, I, remember being, I remember being down in Puerto Rico at uh, at the show we did down there, and bringing Tank out to some of the bars, and he would challenge everybody in the bar, and I'm uh, oh, yeah. very him in the first. And so many people were bringing in glasses of vodka, but at first it looked like it was going to be a brawl. <laughs> he wanted to, he wanted to fight him, you know. That kind of gives me an opening when you talk about that. I I, I had a, a, a coach and mentor that passed away just last week was was Billy Wick. And he's trained a lot of us here in the Carolinas in, in the submissions and, and a lot of us coming from a wrestling background. But he he was an old carny, and and when I when I look at like early UFC, it, it kind of like it almost went back to the carnies. And people may not know what that was, but that was where during the carnival, they had boxing and wrestling tents where people would challenge all comers from the crowd. Yes. And, and that's a really cool part of history. And, 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 and UFC kind of continued along that. And you had Orion Gracie working with you. It was awesome. How did you get hooked up with Orion? Well, you know, I, in doing my research, I, I was uh, actually developed the idea for an advertising client, and then they rejected it as being too violent. But one of the things I had discovered in my research, that there was an article in Playboy magazine back in 89 about the Gracies. The name of the article was Bad, B-A-D, in which the Gracies had been challenging anybody and everybody going back uh, to their father's era, where he had challenged boxer Joe Lewis, Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Waldex, Abisco, Fred Ebert, you know, a lot of the, the top uh, the, of the top carny guys that I talk about, he, he, he competed against uh, it's all in the, the Russell Tumble book, uh, Masahiku Komura, um, who was, a, who was a, a pro wrestler in Judoka that, that uh, actually broke his arm and he never tapped, uh, never tapped because he was that tough. Uh, the, the, the legend Elio Gracie. Um, yeah, I mean, this is all history that, that nobody knows about. It's kind of been lost in the days in the modern uh, UFC, in the modern MMA. Well, you know, Matt, my great uh, advantage was that I was a good student of history. Frank Gosh, uh, when I found out that Elio uh, uh, Gracie had defeated against Vladislav Zabisco, who was a great strong man, great oh, yeah. and a great wrestler, I said to myself, you know something? These people down in Brazil were on to something, and they had a carnival history going back to the early days of Valley Two in Brazil. Oh yeah, they did. Yeah, they did. And the Grace and the Gracie family ran it, uh, as we chronicled in the book. Uh, Count Coma, uh, yeah. Mitsuya Maeda, 
who trained the, the Gracies, one of their expensive trainers, that's where he came from. Uh, he came from challenging all comers in the carnival down there. So it's a rich history that crosses continent. It's a very rich history, and the one about Count Cole is exactly right on. And that inspired me because when I met the Gracies, they wanted to do the Gracie Challenge, but I could say to Orion at the time, you know, you've never been able to get anybody to put up $100,000 and you don't have $100,000, so these things never things never happen. I said, I had a better idea. Now, it took me a while to convince him, because a lot of people had pitched ideas to him. I was not the first guy. What I was successful in doing, other the fact that I was an advertising man, a madman, is that I, for free, did a campaign to help him sell his videotape instruction uh, videos. And when those videos started to sell like hotcakes, Orion pointed to me and said, hey, you know how to make money with jujitsu. What do we do? I said, well, we do a tournament and we put it on pay-per-view. And that's where he and I formed a company, Wild Promotions in Colorado. I found out that there was a loophole in the law where you could do bare-knuckle boxing in Colorado, bare-knuckle fighting. And I then went out to go recruit a major TV partner in pay-per-view. Everybody turned me down. HBO turned me down. They were boxing guys. Showtime turned me down. They loved the boxing. ESPN, they said, what else you got? I said, this is all I got. But I believe in this. This was the glory of ancient Greece. Polydamus was the great grappler fighter in, in the Pancration event back in 648 BC. We're going to bring the glory of ancient Greece back to life again. Now, all those people thought I was crazy. But I got lucky and I was able to find Semaphore Entertainment Group. And they were being funded by like Bertels and his music group in Europe. And Matthew, that was the largest privately held entertainment company on the planet Earth at the time. So with that kind of funding, we wound up doing the first event, a tournament, with eight guys in a single elimination tournament. And at the end of the night, there'd be only two guys facing each other. You had to fight three times in one night to win. You had to be out of a stunt. Come oh on. yeah, absolutely, and that and that, and that first one, if I remember correctly, uh, Ken Shamrock had come over from Japan because Japan kind of had their, their own MMA, and you mentioned Pan uh, Pancration. They had their the Pancras organization, which which was you know it's still questionable to this day if it was a mix of, of works and shoots uh, or or 100 uh, percent on the level. But he came from that. He came from that, and he he went all the way to the finals against uh Royce Gracie and that was unbelievable that was and no one had seen anything like that to that to that day I remember my old wrestling coach Ken Russell talking about Royce Gracie and he was kind of dumbfounded you know you, you, you're kind of dumbfounded because you don't want to lay on your back and, I, and people people learned a whole new style from that you know Ken came over from uh like Gracie started almost at the same time as we had with the Oakland Fighting Championship and I knew by my investigation that they were doing what was known as a mixed event. It was part work, part shoot. And yeah. when I called Ken at the Lions, I actually got another one of his students that first applied to a magazine ad in one of the martial arts magazines. He wanted to be in the event. When I got talking to him, Matthew, I re he said to me, hey, you need to be talking to my coach, my teacher, my trainer, Ken Wayne Shamrock. So that's how I got talking to Ken over in Japan. And Ken kept saying to me, is this really a shoot? I said, absolutely. And yet when he got there on Tuesday of that week, flying in from Japan, and I saw him at the gym on Wednesday, he was still asking me, he said, Art, is this a shoot, a shoot or a work? He said, this yeah. is a guy who in karate pajamas, who's never had a pro fight. He was talking about Royce Gracie. I said, Ken, trust me on this. I told you it's a shoot. It's a shoot. You're going to see Friday night. Is this is not a work in any way, shape, or form. He met a hoist in the semifinal, and hoist got him in a choke, and Ken was stunned. Stunned. He couldn't believe he was losing to this guy who weighed 175 pounds. Ken at the time was weighing 215. He looked like a oh, yeah. guy. Oh, yeah. He was ripped at that time. He still is. He's still in great shape. Great shape. Yeah, that's, that was unbelievable. That that was an unbelievable show, that first show. And what you just talked about was something that nobody really knows was that this was going on to a, a different degree in Japan. Uh, 
you know, Eric Paulson was, was champion of Shuto, and he, he claims he was trying to get on the UFC. How did you select uh, who was going to compete in these tournaments? Well, I was getting a lot of response to the advertising we were doing, and Matthew, after we did the first one, then my phone started to ring off the hook. I would have people send me videos. I would go out and I would go to the schools and the tournaments and I would uh, check out fighters. I was the booker and the matchmaker. And uh, I was constantly looking, uh, whether it was somebody from Sumo, like Emmanuel Yarko, or it was somebody from Tempo, um, uh, Xing Yi, uh, Wu Shu, um, Penn Jack Salat. I brought in the uh, first European to win the Penn Jack Salat Championship in Jakarta. In UFC 2, I brought in kick fighters from Holland who had been teaching and training in, in the Bangkok in Thailand and who and could kick to the leg. Uh, I brought in Balotudo guys who, had, who were uh, Luke and Libre who had studied Muay Thai, like, um, um, uh, you know, the oh, first God, one of the Luke and Libre guys you, you brought in. And I can remember Marco Luas, he had the king of the streets. The king of the streets, and, and, and he, man, he, he was. He was slick. I remember his uh, match against. Who was a real big guy that he that he had to fight against? Paul, Paul Warren. Paul. Yeah, that was a classic. And you know what? I also do, Matthew. I'm very proud of. Early on, starting in UFC three, I bring in bring in the wrestler. I had seen a video of Hicks and Gracie rolling with um, with the Mac Mark Schultz. Mark Schultz. Oh yeah, now yeah. that that's legendary, and I can tell you a little backstory to that because I know Mark Schultz. I was I was involved with a company called Wrestling Analytics with Mark Schultz, and we did uh, technical breakdowns. And I asked him about that because I had heard about that, and that was the one where he held Dixon in a cradle until his arms lost their strength, and Dixon ended up finishing him. It took about 30 minutes. I either took place at Pedro Sauer School there in Salt Lake or at Brigham Young itself. But I remember saying to myself at the time, because Corey and Gracie, you know, they're counted it. Oh, he said, these wrestlers don't know anything. I looked at that and said, you know something? These wrestlers, when they pick up a few submissions, they go back to catch his catch can, these wrestlers are going to be formidable. So I brought in Severin. I brought oh, in Kerr. Yeah. We brought in Coleman. I brought in Couture. The, the list went on, and it changed the UFC. And suddenly the martial arts crowd, the karate boys, started to say, hey, these wrestlers are tough. Yeah, I mean, it's like my, with myself personally. I've never really liked the word you know, karate or martial arts, but I started out wrestling, you know, I was 12 years old in the mid-'80s, and, and, and I've always felt like wrestling was the strongest thing. Like, you never really needed anything else. But I think UFC did two things. It showed how tough the wrestlers are, but it also showed that the wrestlers need to diversify their, their own skills, you know, to be able to, to beat mixed opponents. When, when mixed opponents are able to stuff takedowns and, and learn wrestling themselves. Right. I, to me, one of the first great complete fighters was Randy Couture. You know, I brought him in and matched him up against a pro wrestler. Um, you know, uh, Tony Halmade, who wrestled for the WWE as Count Lucas. Oh, yeah. Lucas Borgia, yeah. Yeah, and, 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 and Couture destroyed him. It was a very fast ending. Couture was, you know, the wrestlers had proved to me that one of the things the wrestlers did, they had a cut weight, they knew how to get in top condition, their cardio was always great. And once they started to master how to deal with a striker, wrestlers became a bird down the course. When Mark Coleman became... Of the biggest dog in the UFC. Was, everyone was scared to death of them. I, oh, yeah, I, I couldn't, I could not believe, Art, I could not believe, and knowing Dan so well, I could not believe how Mark Coleman ran through Dan Severn in their fight. Mark Coleman at the time, and I've said it on his Facebook page when he had a birthday last year, at the time, Mark Coleman was the most feared man on the planet. I, guys would tell me, I don't want to go up against Coleman. He's in the tournament, or you want to give me a super fight with him? What else you got? You know, people would run from that. Coleman scared the pants off of everybody. He was big and strong, and he, he was the king of grounded pound. He oh, was, yeah. Yeah, the godfather of grounded pound. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. He, he, and, he, yeah. and, you know, a hugely influential guy, uh, my, one of my best friends, uh, uh, Phil Baroni, who I think Phil, Phil probably joined UFC towards the tail end of your, uh, your ownership. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, he came yes. right after he was gone. Uh, Phil had a great impact. Great personality, by the way. Great star. 
Oh, yeah, and I just want to give a cheap plug. Well, we miss me or afterwards, but Phil and I have a little, a little pro wrestling tag team that he created uh, called the Border Patrol. We are supposedly wow. Donald Trump's commission border agents, and we take on a lot of the luchadors. And we'll be, we'll be there next week. I'll be in Las Vegas, Nevada, uh, over at uh, the Silver Dollar Casino on May 20th for Future Stars of Wrestling. And uh, we'll be doing a tag team um, out there in Vegas. Very cool. Wow. Yeah, so we have a good, always, have, always having a good time, Art David. Well, I want to ask you, I mean, UFC, unbelievable. How did your uh, run with UFC uh, come to come to an end? And what was, what was the tail end of it like? Because I know there was a lot of legal pressure from guys like, you know, I'm not a big fan of this guy, I have to say, although I did vote for him one time for president. Uh, John McCain uh, was putting a lot of pressure uh, on ending the UFC's tenure, and, and there was a lot of legal questions. A lot of people forget that now. So I think a lot of the younger fans who come in the last five years didn't know that back in the day, John McCarthy and I were under the gun. Uh, John was my great referee. I was the commissioner at the time. And he and I would wind up going to a particular city with Central Point Entertainment, uh, who was at that time producing the show, and we would have to testify in front of the judge or in front of the sports commission uh, about the rules and about safety, because at that time the, the pressure was really on. And like when we were in um, in Charlotte, North Carolina, the police were telling our fighters that if they fought on Friday night, they could be arrested. And some of my uh, athletes were police officers themselves and were worried they'd lose their badge. So when we did Detroit UFC 10, the judge ruled that there could be no closed fist punching. He was willing to let it go. He said, but there can't be any closed fist bare knuckle punching. So and that was, and that was that the controversial fight with uh, the, the rematch between Ken Shamrock and Dan Sever? Yes. Because okay, yes, yeah, so explain that, because that's huge in history, because uh, you know, that, that's one where there's a lot of gray area there. Yeah. You know, you bring up a good point there, Matthew. That was an interesting situation, because the judge, by ruling that, threw the entire show upside down. Seven was being interviewed on radio during that week. He said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to punch anyway. And Shamrock that week was being interviewed by Sports Illustrated, who was saying to him, hey, you're an inspiration to kids now in America, not only at the Shamrock home, which your, your, your uh, adopted father founded, but kids everywhere. So you're not going to punch, right, Ken? So Ken was under tremendous pressure. He figured, hey, if Severin's going to punch, uh, what, am I not going to punch? And I had gone around with John McCarthy in the dressing room that Friday night and telling everybody, if you punch, I'm going to find you $100 for each punch. And that night, Mark Schultz was matched up at the last minute up against Gary Goodrich, uh, the former arm wrestling champ who later became a big star in K1. And he beat Gary with 41 punches. They're not for punches. I should have been fighting him $4,000. Monday morning, the judge was looking for all of us. He said that we had violated the court, and we never went back to Detroit. So there was tremendous pressure. John McCain called it human cockfighting. The New York Times said it was barbaric. And I got to tell you that by 1997, uh, Time Warner, Viewers' Choice, had basically marginalized us in pay per view. We had lost the major source of revenue. A lot of fans they don't realize for a while there, we weren't on pay per view back in '97. They basically had shut us out. So. We were, we were under the gun, and we were being driven. And the politicians and the media let it. They said it was, you know, it was unfair and it was barbaric, and the bare knuckle fighting was for, uh, for thugs and criminals. And yet we would tell them, look, bare knuckle fighting is actually safer. And Shamrock oh, yeah. and Ripley would say, hey, punching a guy in the head with your bare fist like getting a bowling ball. It's my, anybody, who's, anybody who's ever been in a, in a street fight or a bar fight knows that because if you if you punch with your fist uh, as opposed to as opposed to wearing anything that's anything that's shielding the uh, the blow from your fist, you're, you're going to break knuckles and you know you yeah you're going to have to hit with elbows and headbutts and other things. So you know it was counterintuitive, and the young fans didn't know that we were we were being chased. You know, Puerto Rico, they ruled against us, Detroit. Uh, you know, we, we wound up only doing these shows then in Augusta, Birmingham, or Bay St. Louis, Mississippi. We were, you know, we couldn't even get into the Charlottes and the Denvers anymore. And forget going back, you know, we had gotten it sanctioned in New York. 
So then they changed their mind. And we had to move the show that was going to be held up around Niagara Falls down to Dothan, Alabama on short notice, UFC 12. That was Randy Couture's first show. That was Joe Rogan's first show. We had to move that show on Wednesday night, fly everybody down south to do that show at a sellout Friday night in Dothan, Alabama. They chased us out of New York. So fans today don't know what it was like back in the day. But I got to tell you, an eight-man tournament where you had to fight three times in one night, it was rough. There was no weight classes, and there was nobody there to protect you. You were on your own, baby. And if you were, you truly were the ultimate fighter. Absolutely. That's a, that's a totally, totally different world. People can't, people can't even understand that. And uh, you talk about, you're moving from Alabama or from New York to Alabama. Um, that, that's crazy, especially like right before the fight. I mean, kids now would never want to do that. And uh, it's a totally yeah. different world. Now, let me ask you this, and, 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 and from a promotional-minded uh, perspective, why wouldn't you kind of circumvent um, by going to uh, Indian casinos? Well, you know, back in the day, uh, you know, we knew our main source of revenue was pay-per-view, number one. And quite frankly, we, we, this was conceived as a franchise with a long-term future in history. And we, we didn't want to feel that we would just be marginalized on, on Native American properties. And quite frankly, um, pay-per-view I took a dim view of something that could only be done on sovereign land, basically, which isn't the United States. So there was a lot of pressure for us to do what eventually Zupa did, and that is to get on broadcast, to get the box. Uh, you know, and the yeah. idea that if you were to move away from pay-per-view in cities like Detroit, where we were, or Charlotte, or, or uh, uh, Buffalo, New York, and to move this thing to, uh, you know, to a Native American property in a part of the country that everybody would say, well, where is that? You know, and I, if I wanted to go see it, where would I have to drive to? So there was a lot of pressure on us, Matthew, to, to keep this thing on the high road. But by 1997, I knew that we were in big trouble. I had made a decision to sell out Dow promotions. At one time, I owned 25% of the UFC. Uh, our company was 50%, along with some of that owned the other 50 And I sold out a half because I saw the handwriting on the wall. Now, I stayed on board for two and a half years as the commissioner to book fights, to do match maybe, to be involved with the rules and the medical. And yet, by late 1997, boy, the handwriting was on the wall. 1998, January, I finally left the UFC. And quite frankly, at that point, we were only on direct TV, a little bit satellite. And uh, by the time the Zupa bought it in 2001, they were able to buy it for a song because <clears throat> it had been basically shoved to the margin, shoved to the edge. Who, who did they buy it from in, in 2001? They bought it from Semaphore Entertainment, which was our original joint venture partner in 1993. That was, the UFC was owned by two companies, Wild Promotions, the company that I started with, Horian Racing, we owned 50%, Semaphore on the other 50%. And in 1995, I made the decision, and I talk about it in my book, for us to sell out the semaphore. I felt that they were going to stop us when we had to hire both civil and criminal attorneys in Charlotte. That's in the New South. I figured, if they're getting oh, yeah. the hard in the New South, hey, we'll never get to Los Angeles and Chicago. Man, you know, and, and they chased us out of Detroit. So I made the decision then that to sell. But I stayed on board because I was the only one who knew how to do the tournament. I just yeah. sold a pipe to that. So I stayed on board until January of 98, and to answer your question, Supa, the company started by Lorenzo Frank Petita with uh, Dana White as a minority partner, they bought it from Bob Meyerwitz at Semaphore Entertainment, and he was able to sell it to them for $2 million. Oh yeah, I mean, you think about it, you, that, that's huge, and you think about it, and, and growing up through that, like in the 90s, and when you first started it, when it was, when it was that brand new, it was huge with pay-per-view, and then I think blockbuster video. But like you're saying, like in 98, I didn't even think or give, pay attention to anything UFC from 98 until I went with uh, Phil to um, Mohegan Sun when he fought Dave Manet on Mohegan Sun, and that, and that was like 2003. So you're talking about uh, like five years there. And, and even then, even then, and that was, that was uh, his famous knockout where he jumped on the cage and said, I'm the best ever, and I was 
you know, I always tell everybody, you know, same thing with we'll, we'll our next guest on when I was supposed to be in his corner and, and, uh, and, and I turned and the fight was over. That was over in a flash. It was not even, you know, that was a quick knockout uh, victory, which is huge for him. But what you're talking about, even with Phil, he went, he went and fought in pride and UFC didn't really pop to the mainstream until the Ultimate Fighter reality series, which I want to say the first series, first season was 2004-2005. So uh, you're talking about a gap in years there where, where UFC was completely out of sight and out of mind. So they were easy, they were able to come in and swoop up and buy it. But let, let me point this out also, uh, Matthew, that uh, between 1993 and 1996, 97, we were doing pay-per-view numbers that it took super years to get close to. By UFC 2, we did 300,000 buys, and that's when the awesome. universe, your homes that were wired, was only 33 million. Today, awesome. the universe is 100 million homes. So our numbers at wrestling and boxing wetting their pants, they were shocked. And yet, they were out getting banned in 97, or by Time Warner. Then suddenly, the UFC was, was, uh, was gone. It was shoved into the corner. That's why the, uh, the super was able to buy it at that fire sale price. You couldn't find it at that point. It was a little bit on direct uh, satellite, but by and large, you couldn't find it. It wasn't around. And he I, I told it to you, I'll say this. Uh, the reason I'm talking to you and doing this interview tonight is that Super came on board in 2001, and they proceeded to invest about $50 million into the UFC, and they were able to get it eventually on the Fox TV broadcast, and uh, they, they were able to get into the mainstream. And if they hadn't been able to do that, the UFC would simply be a footnote, and so would I. Absolutely, a absolutely. And you know, the other thing you talked about, and, and people still long for this, just just last week, um, I was doing some clinics with uh, the Beast Fan Seven, and we did a radio show in Greenville uh, for the Planet for the big morning show, biggest uh, rock morning show in South Carolina for the Rise Guys. And Dan was on there. You know, Dan can extend a yarn. Dan can talk for hours. You give him a microphone, and he he can just talk. And that was one of the things she was talking about. And what the hosts were saying, and the hoster guys you know, probably a little younger than me, you know, early 40s, late 30s, and the hosts are on there, and they're talking about how they long for the old UFC. They remember how it was in the old days. And that's, and, and it was so, to me, it was so much cooler, you know, when you had, when you had all these different styles, and you had open weight. And, you know, now it's become, almost like, you know, a, a kickboxing match, you know, with wrestling mixed in. It's not the, it's not the same thing that it was. Um, and, and the sport, combat sports, have to evolve. And I want to talk to you about evolving, and I want to talk to you about K1, and I want to kind of close the show with an idea I have for a, a potential future of that, that's, uh, that will evolve things in, in a wild and wacky direction. But after selling the, the sale of... Uh, uh, with some four entertainment group to Zufa, um, you were you were a major player, vice president of K One. Everybody listening knows K One. Uh, well, at that point, um, Master Rishi in Japan called me up and said, "I know you're available now." He said, "I want to be able to bring K One to America," and um, he uh, hired me to start a corporation in America. And uh, I found out, though, that all of the, uh, uh, the content that he had was not owned by K1, it was owned by Sony. So I had difficulty being able to run a lot of the great fights which they had been doing in Japan with guys like Peter Hartz and Andy Hoog and Ernesto Hoost. And I wanted to show those on ESPN every night for hours so the audience would become aware that there was this incredible sport in Japan that was as big as the Super Bowl. And I went over to Japan uh, five, five or seven times in 98 alone and studied what they were doing over there and brought the first K-1 to America at the Mirage Hotel uh, in, Los, in Las Vegas uh, in 1998 in August. We unfortunately had to be on the same night that the WWE was at Sturgis with the, all the Harley riders. Oh, yeah, yeah. But um, because of the K-1 schedule, but uh, it was a big hit. Uh, Steve Wynn sat right next to me there at the uh, K-1 event at the Mirage, and uh, the late Andy Hu fought. Um, I had Ernesto Hoost. I had, uh, uh, you know, some of the great American kickboxers on the card. 
And um, the American fans got a chance to see what K1 was all about. But K1, it was difficult with Sony owning the, uh, the content for us to promote it the way I would have liked to. But K1 is a tremendous sport, and those American fans that had never seen a K1 final at the end of the year in December, you know, with the Berlin Philharmonic being brought from Berlin. Oh, yeah, that was awesome. Unbelievable. And, and bringing fighters in as if they were on, on spaceships, uh, flying saucers. I, I never saw a production of wrestling, boxing, kickboxing, MMA show with the production values that K1 had. I was stunned. I was over there as a color commentator for the last couple of shows in 98 and 99, and I can tell you that the Japanese really know how to stage a combat sport. Very exciting. Absolutely. Absolutely. It all, it all kind of emanates going way back in history. You know, not to bore people with Ricky Dozan and, and pro wrestling leading up to leading up to Pride, leading up to we talked about, you know, with Pancras. Their fans are so respectful and their and, uh, uh, and their production value is tremendous. Just compare like, you know, Pride to UFC. And uh, it's unbelievable in and, and your production value. In, in the UFCs were outstanding. And, and Bellator's production value, and I want to mention Bellator because Sean Wheelock, who many know as the commentator for Bellator, uh, wrote um, your book with you, your, your autobiography, yeah. which is fantastic. Uh, is this legal, the inside story of the first UFC from the man who created it? Uh, so talk about that a little bit. You know, uh, I did full credit to Sean Wheelock, who approached me in 2011. He was a big fan. He said, you know, you've got to tell the story. A lot of younger fans don't know how this sport got created. And other than Dr. James Naismith, who invented basketball, there hasn't been anybody that's been able to kind of invent the new sport the last hundred years. So Sean kept bugging me about, we got to do this book. And he said, I'm going to find a publisher. And he did. He found a sports publisher, a celebrity book publisher in uh, Kansas City and uh, send books, and he and I went to work. I moved up here to Nevada to concentrate on the book, and starting in August of 2013, we completed the book, uh, 271 pages, about 100,000 words in June of 2014. The book was published, and we've gotten five-star reviews across the board. Everyone who's read the book has been very impressed. It chronicles the four years from October of 89, when I first started to develop the idea for the world's best fighter, the War of the Worlds, and finally ends the night uh, after the first UFC when we held the Monsters Ball, the first cocktail party in formal clothes where everybody stayed up and party the whole night. So it goes from 89 all the way to 93. It's a great story. Last year in April, uh, Legacy Entertainment Partners in Los Angeles optioned it for a film. They commissioned uh, a team of writers to do a script. I've now seen the second draft. And they're very excited about moving this forward to producing this as a major motion picture. They should. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a great story because you literally, and nobody can do this. Everybody does uh, what's called, you know, you, you take something that works. In other words, you, you take a product that, that's existing and you make it better. You know, you, but, or, or you try to massage it and you, and you turn it into something else. No one ever starts something completely new. And that's what you talked about, like, with basketball. And that's what you want to explain, you know, to people. You literally created a new sport that, I mean, it, it had roots in the carnies and maybe had roots in some of the, you know, the, the, the uh, uh, mixed bouts, uh, which, you know, of, year, of yesteryear. But you took that to a whole another level and you created a whole sport around it, which is now literally, their ratings are literally beating uh, Major League Baseball's, uh, NBA, they're, they're, they're on par with the NFL. This is one of the biggest sports in the world. And you literally created this sport. You know, Matthew, I tell the story though that uh, I, I was smart enough to realize that by bringing back the glories of Pancration in ancient Greece, uh, that there was a precedent for it, number one. And number two, wherever you go on the planet Earth today and yesterday and tomorrow, there's the martial arts. Oh, yeah. Whether you're in India or in Brooklyn, New York, or in Oslo, Norway, they're practicing the martial arts. Other than soccer, the martial arts are the most universal physical activity for young men and women. 
And there's something else. There's something else to that. There's another piece to that puzzle that I've talked to um, some, some some fighters on the show, uh, good friends of mine uh, that I've either either coached or cornered. And we had uh, we had some folks on that talk about this. And this is kind of the, the other edge to that sword is, you know, nobody thinks that they can beat Tiger Woods in golf. Nobody right. thinks that they can beat. Uh, Derek Jeter in a home run contest, but everybody thinks that they can fight, and that is really what drives the ratings because people are watching that and they are living uh, a lot of times vicariously through these warriors that they see in the cage. It's it, you know it's 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 really you know the keyboard warriors you talk about all that, but even before that, even before there was a keyboard or an internet. People always felt that they could kick someone else's booty, you know? I'll tell you something else that ties into that, because you have, have a very good point there, Matthew. Gloria and Gracie used to always say to me, if you're in a boxing match and a fight breaks out and the audience, guess where everybody turns and looks? To the audience. They look to the fight in, in the audience. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and you know, that's what the early UFC had. For you young fans today who've grown up in the last five years watching the UFC and MMA, what you got to remember is those early shows were unbelievable. They were wild. Well, you didn't know what you were going to see because you didn't know what I was going to produce. You didn't know who I was going to pull out of the woodwork, whether it was a 650-pound sumo wrestler or a 200-pound karate guy from Chicago who owned an air conditioning business or a pro boxer from South Carolina. You know, uh, whoever. It was always a big surprise. And we all wondered who's going to win. Who's going to be the big dog? Who's going to be the apex predator, the great white shark? You had, you had it all there. I mean, you look at everybody that you mentioned. Every size and shape, they were there in the, in the early UFCs. And, and I want to really urge people... Uh, to go back and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of an old, kind of an old fart because I, I still think, you know, hey, go to Blockbuster Video and, and, uh, rent these, uh, VHS tapes, but that, that's kind of a thing of the past. So how can people watch the early UFCs? I, I, when you don't even know myself. Well, I tell you, the real answer to that is that they've been talking to me about recording some, some, uh, some stories around them is go to Fight Pass, the UFC's Fight Pass. They've got all the early UFCs, and now they've also acquired about 10 other franchises in the MMA world, and they're showing their, uh, um, their fight footage as well. Sure, you know, franchises like Invicta, the Old Girls League, or Gladiator Challenge, or uh, King of the Cage. If you're an MMA fight fan, Fight Pass is pretty much the place to go because 724, you can watch everything that's ever been done in the MMA business over the last 20 years. Sounds like UFC Fight Pass. And, you know, Art, I would really hope that you're getting a cut of that UFC Fight Pass because you started this whole uh, shebang. Well, you know, I, uh, I sold out years ago, and as I've said to fans, and I've done an interview since then, I had a great ride. It was a great uh, opportunity for me to, to hit a home run. And, you know, when I was in the advertising business, I used to always say my real job is to help companies uh, feed their families, uh, pay their mortgages, put food on the table, you know, sell more product, more shoes, more clothes, more houses, whatever I was helping somebody to advertise. So with the UFC, I've been able to help create a sport where people are, are doing this, writing about it, clothing lines, teaching, managing, training, promoting all over the planet Earth. I have fans in Turkey, Afghanistan, Norway, Argentina, uh, uh, Bangkok, Thailand, the Philippines. Unbelievable. Uh, I'm very gratified today to realize that the UFC and MMA has become ubiquitous, baby. It's all over the planet Earth. And it's only going to be bigger. In 20 years, it will even be bigger than it is today. It, is, it, it continues to grow, and you are you are in the MMA Hall of Fame with an elite class of uh, with John McCarthy, Pat Militich, uh, Fedor Melnyenko, Hicks and Gracie, and the Beast, Dan Severn, among others, uh, which is which is awesome. And that's the real Hall of Fame, I think, near the MMA Hall of Fame, which which is outstanding. Now, talk about something else I came across when I was researching you. What is X Arm? You know, uh, uh, somewhere around 2008, I got a call from a production company in Seattle, and they said, we got a goofy idea. And we were told that if we want to develop it, we either talk to Hulk Hogan or to talk to you. I said, what's the goofy idea? They said, well, we want to combine arm wrestling and fighting. 
And so we're happy about that. But I met with them, and they had money, and they wanted to develop this, and they uh, wanted me to develop a sport. They wanted me to create some boot camps, bring in arm wrestlers, kickboxers, MMA fighters, and to design a table that they just could be competed on. And they thought it would work really well on like cell phones, on smartphones, you know, on pads. Because it was, you know, the, the fighting arena was 16 by 28 inches. And I wrote up a set of rules. I held three or four boot camps, brought in different kinds of athletes, brought in Ted Williams from Gladiator Challenge to help me uh, coach people and train people. And uh, we wound up doing uh, several uh, um, uh, uh, tournaments. And we wound up doing a, a, a reality show, a 96 episode reality show on the cinema and on Right TV. And, um, you know, it was uh, I, even more, in a way, more creating something from scratch than with the UFC. With the UFC, I was inviting people from existing martial arts, whether it was wrestling, karate, boxing, etc. But with XRM, I was literally creating a sport from scratch. And that's kind of tough, because if you liked it on TV, where do you go practice it? What, what gym was also doing it? It's a, it, it, it's you. it is unique, and it's wild, and uh, I love it. And, and that's what... And, and I'm gonna and I'm gonna talk about something I have not talked about on the show yet, and that's that's kind of why I wanted to ask about X Arm. And um, my producer Brian Snow knows about this. The New York Badass Phil Baroni knows about this. Dan the Beast knows about this. We talked about it late when he was here last week. And I've got a couple other good close friends that know about this, but I'm gonna tell you my concept and. I'm gonna, um, we've got about five minutes left and I'm gonna take it, take two to three minutes to explain it and then get your take on it. Um, I feel like um, the, the world of mixed martial arts is if, if, if you don't evolve, you're gonna die. And I've created a concept that is evolutionary, if not revolutionary, and it is not mixed martial arts, it is not sumo wrestling, it is not uh, freestyle wrestling, it is not professional wrestling, but it combines elements of all four, and it is very unique, and I call it King of the Mountain, and uh, let me just explain some of the production uh, concepts, and, uh, and, and just the idea of how a King of the Mountain would work. Uh, you would have uh, you would you would have a dozen competitors. They would all compete in a lottery. Uh, they would all pick cards. So um, one through twelve. Okay. Now we all know the game King of the Mountain or King of the Hill that we play. You know when we're kids. Or, you know those of us who were raised in the seventies, eighties, into the nineties. Uh, the kids today may not may not play it. I don't know, but it's. But, but it's a very commonly uh, known game. So you have uh, basically a body of water that surrounds a um, very gothically constructed mountain with a mat on the top. And those of us that have wrestled, it's going to be basically the circumference of what you would you would have in, the, in a wrestling mat. But it would be surrounded by rope ladders. Okay. And you're going to have four, your first four competitors come out. So whoever draws from one to four come out. And um, the, the whole part of the concept is um, that, you know, we've, we've heard a lot of people talk about head trauma. Uh, yeah. This, this is not a sport where a knockout counts as anything. So the competitors come out with headgear, um, they come out with shin guards, the whole deal. And you can use all of the tactics of wrestling and fighting, but your goal is not to knock out, your goal is not to submit, your goal is to knock people off of the mountain. So you start out with four, and then um, every three minutes, you bring two new competitors in. So you start out with four, then comes five, six. You may be down to two. You may be down to one. You may be down to three. You may be, have all four. They, it does not start until they climb up the rope ladder and their feet touch the mat. So you've got five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. It does not end 
until there is only one man standing at the top of the mountain. And that man is king of the mountain. What do you, th- what do you think about that, Art Davy? Well, that's, that's a wild concept, very much made for television. Um, and, you know, I think you might have a big audience for that, as long as because it's a game that a lot of kids play. We all were exposed to that at some point as a kid, I think. Yeah, and it, it, it's not, you know, it, it's like it, it's like constant excitement in the sense that um, you've got, you could, the wrestlers could, sh- you could shoot a double, like you could shoot a hard double and you could tumble over with your opponent. So you have yeah. to create strategies. It, it basically becomes its own sport where guys are creating strategies. You can form alliances, you know, within within the group, you know, of, of folks. Uh, and, and there's that lottery lottery system. And I was thinking about um, as the competitors come out, um, they come out with that body of water surrounding the the mountain. Uh, you've got a couple of very sexy, voluptuous, bikini clad ladies that escort each competitor out with you know music playing like you'd have in UFC. But they, they escort them out and they, as opposed to ring girls, they're escorting them out and then they're climbing up those rope ladders. And then as soon as the competition engages, those you, they press a button, those rope ladders shoot up and then well, when it gets to the countdown, you know, ten nine, eight, seven, when the next group are coming down, the rope ladders drop back down. So, you know, you've got a, you've got a lot of bells and whistles on that as well. Well, that's a pretty uh, wild and crazy idea. When do you plan on mistaking the first one, Matthew Graham? Well, I have been talking with uh, the Cherokee Casino in North Carolina, uh, okay. which you might be familiar with, and I've also been talking with a promoter here um, that is known in the pro wrestling circles, um, uh, Chuck Sloan. Um, he, he's, he's done beer days involved with me a couple times where he's had uh, some, some uh, B and C level celebrities come out. Um, and he's hot on the idea. So, I, so I, we're going to actually have him on as a guest. And I'm looking for him to, to promote the first one. But I, I'd like to take this to a bigger stage and get it on pay-per-view. Well, it sounds like if you do that first one under your belt and you work out the bugs and you tweak it, you might have a, a viable product that you could uh, then move forward and raise some additional capital and see if you can't move forward to getting it on a pay-per-view or getting it on a cable. 